In January 2017, Tahi's entourage prepares to eliminate Khalid, known by the nickname Emo. This damn dog provides information about what he hears and sees to this moose. By moose, he refers to Mustafa Af, with whom he has been engaged in an open conflict for over a year. Moose is an experienced criminal who operates in the cocaine trade much like Tahi. Sending a clear and strong message in this milieu becomes a critical matter. Any collaboration with Moose will be severely reprimanded. It's noteworthy that within Tahir's organization, his right-hand man, Saeed, is accompanied by his brother, Mohammed. According to the judicial authorities, Ridwan maintains regular contact with Mohammed, who passes on information regarding the mission targeting Emo. Brother, this guy Emo used to work at Malabata. Do you know him? Malabata refers to the former coffee shop located on the Amsterdam Sestrathwerk shopping street in Utrecht. Ten minutes later... All right, just make that son of a... handicapped. Salam, sir. This GPS is malfunctioning. I think it's due to the cold. But this guy is now at... His car is parked right in front of the door. Can't you just figure out where he is inside and what he's wearing so we can film the right person? Khaled changes locations frequently, but he's often found in the shopping streets of Amsterdam Sestrathwerk in Utrecht, or on Moseldrief Street, where he spends a lot of time in a shisha lounge, or even at the New York pizza branch that he visits daily. Nabil a member of Ridwan's organization, provides support by making observations to collect a description of the target, its number plate and its photo. Mohammed plays a crucial role in Nabil's reconnaissance activities, as it is he who keeps Ridwan up to date with the latest information. From what I can see, he's here, bro. He's wearing a black and white D-squared cap, and his brother's Audi car is also parked in front of the door. If it's indeed him, I can't approach him, because he's inside and everything is closed. Khaled appears to be wearing a D-squared cap, and is driving a car whose number plate is also given. License plate, that's him, according to me. I don't see anyone else. He's parked right at the corner of that restaurant, on the sidewalk to the right when you exit through the door. I'll try to take a photo of him. Yeah, please do, sir. Take a photo to be sure. As part of this operation, it's crucial to take a picture of the target so that the elimination squad can recognize him on the D-Day. During this mission, Emo resides in an apartment located in Faustrief, in a neighborhood in Utrecht. That's where the team will need to take action after thoroughly mapping out his routine. Thank you, bro. I will then give the order to the shooters. However, on January the 11th, it appears that Emo miraculously escapes his attackers without even realizing it. Yes, brother, he narrowly escaped yesterday. He must have a guardian angel watching over him. I know they were already at his door, but he entered through a different entrance. The next day, on January the 12th, the decisive moment finally arrives. In the early morning, a member of Tahi's team spots Emo as he leaves a cafe to return to his home on Faustrief. The team waiting for him on site, in a black Audi A5, consists of two shooters, Farrell and Guino, along with a driver named Justin. At around 0140, a tragic mistake was made, a man was shot and collapsed on the ground in front of the entrance to the building. It quickly becomes apparent that the victim is not Emo, but a certain Hakim, who was also a tenant in the same building and who, according to the file, had apparently left the cafe at the same time as Emo. The two hooded shooters 
quickly returned to the parked Audi in the middle of the road. A witness, observing the scene from his window, saw them flee towards the perpendicular street. The escapees continued at high speed to their destination and got rid of the Audi. Images from cameras on the roof of a building on Vulcanostrief were examined. These images reveal that the Audi arrived at 1.45 a.m. and 9 seconds, heading towards the adjacent street. Finally, the vehicle's lights went out, and 44 seconds later, a violent explosion accompanied by flames is observed. Indeed, the individuals set the car on fire. The traditional modus operandi involves setting the getaway vehicle on fire after an execution. However, mistakes were made. Guino injured his face while trying to ignite the fire, partially burning his balaclava, which was found near the Audi. Furthermore, a yellow lighter used to ignite the fire was discovered, bearing his DNA. As for Farrell, his DNA was identified on the Coca-Cola bottle that had been filled with gasoline. Once the Audi was set on fire, the team ran a short distance to reach the transfer vehicle driven again by Justin, a Toyota Auris to be precise. A few hours later, this vehicle was also found, also in flames, in Amsterdam. Back to Utrecht. Despite the elimination of the wrong target, the signal emerging from the encrypted messages is clear. Error or not, the pursuit of Emo by Tahi must continue immediately. Brother, check if anyone sees Emo today and what he's wearing, please. Brother, see if anyone spots Emo anywhere. The team doesn't get discouraged and continues to conduct surveillance despite the police presence in the area. Brother, please, see if you can get your guys to help your search today, no matter where he might be. To ensure the continuity of the mission, a new team is put in place. The former trio, who fled to Amsterdam on 13th of January 2017, the day after the tragic mistake that led to Hakim's liquidation, returned to the Emo district this time in a Skoda Fabia. Their objective is to show the places frequented by the target to the new duo, composed of Jarel and Marciano. According to Emo's later statements to the police, he regularly visits a shisha lounge, as well as the New York pizza with his friends, the very place where Hakim was a regular customer. Once Emo's daily routine has been explained, the two teams return to Amsterdam to their original point of departure. This is where the old team hands the Skoda over to the new duo, who are tasked with continuing the mission. However, the driver Justin, seemingly determined not to participate in this operation as a driver anymore, chooses to step back and leaves his new teammates. It is noteworthy that during the reconnaissance mission that night in Utrecht, Emo had already noticed the Skoda suspiciously following him. As Emo circled around, the observers began to distance themselves from him out of fear of being discovered, while Emo himself started to follow the Skoda. At 3.12 a.m., after reporting the situation to the police, he eventually lost sight of the car. However, he remains vigilant throughout the following night when Jarel and Marciano return once again to his neighborhood. The dog simply hasn't returned home yet. At 5.11 a.m., Emo once again reports to the police the presence of a suspicious vehicle in his street, fearing that its occupants might harm him. Just 10 minutes later, officers arrive in the adjacent street where the Skoda was driving. When they try to stop it, the vehicle suddenly accelerates. After a high-speed chase reaching up to 160 kilometers per hour, the Skoda crashes on the highway and the duo is apprehended. Inside the car, various items are found, including bottles of cola filled with a yellow liquid 
lighters, and weapons scattered along the highway. All these elements clearly point towards a potential liquidation. Once again, according to the PGP attributed by the courts to Ridwan, they caught the shooters with Kalashnikovs in the trunk and everything. Jarel stated to the police that he received a text message from Marciano asking if he was interested in a quick profit of 2,000 euros and that he had no knowledge of the true nature of the mission. He thought it might be a robbery or a scam, but certainly not a liquidation. Out of fear that Jarrell might speak to the police, the former duo of Farrell and Guino went to his mother's home the day after the arrest. They assured her that Jarrell had done nothing wrong, that he was not aware of what was going to happen, and they conveyed the message that if she talks to her son, she should tell him to stay silent for his own safety. This corresponds to a later recorded confidential communication during a visit from Jarrell's partner in prison. There are three guys, and they've already eliminated one. They went to my mother's, you know. Were those guys the shooters? I don't know. I don't know, probably. Your mother said there was a boy who seemed so familiar to her. He was bold, he had lips like that, just like you. He had that brown color, all pink here. Hmm, hmm, did he have something on his lip? Right? Yes. A dark-skinned boy and a light-skinned boy? Yes, and he had that pink on his lips. Indeed, it's Guino, who burned his lip two days ago while setting fire to the Audi A5 after Hakim's assassination. This matches with his damaged balaclava found near the vehicle. Regarding Jarrell, he appears to be too confident and careless during his monitored conversations in prison. He mentions the existence of a second car, an Audi Q5. The only annoying thing is that there was also an Audi. Yes, a Q5. It was also there. And there were exactly the same things inside. I was there too, but no fingerprints. I just hope my hair didn't fall inside. That would be the only possible thing. Otherwise, they have absolutely nothing on me. Indeed, an Audi Q5 was discovered by the authorities in Utrecht on Achillestrief Street, which is right next to the street where the other Audi had been set on fire two days earlier, during the first part of the mission targeting Emo. It is well known that individuals who commit liquidations often use multiple getaway vehicles to reduce the risk of capture. Furthermore, it's common for cars used in these missions to be set on fire to erase the evidence. In the Audi Q5, the authorities found cola bottles filled with gasoline and lighters. In this second part of the mission, Jarrell and his accomplice were supposed to carry out a vehicle swap between the Skoda and the Audi Q5 once Emo had been eliminated. But this did not happen due to the intervention of the police. In short, two separate teams were tasked with eliminating Emo, but both failed in their mission. However, another issue also arises. This involves Justin, the driver of the first team, who was supposed to remain involved in the second liquidation attempt before deciding to withdraw. A wiretapped conversation between Jarrell and his friend reveals that this decision could have cost him dearly, thus putting his own life in danger. What about Justin? Yes. Was he also in the car with you? Yes, he was also in the car with me. That day as well, Justin was saying, uh, I'm stopping, I'm stopping. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm not participating anymore. This guy with his burnt lips said, when you're out, no one will be able to help you anymore. No one will be able to come to your aid anymore. Be careful with what you're doing. He said, no, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. And he ran away. The fact that Justin refused to cooperate to finish the job and that he knew too much about the mission aligns perfectly with the new willingness of the organization led by Tahi 
to hold someone accountable for the accidental first killing. Given that Hakim is a member of a well-known family in Utrecht, it's evident that heads will have to roll. It's crucial to contextualize the situation surrounding the alleged organization of the Mokro Mafia godfather, Redouan Tahi. The first major case related to him dates back to 2015, known as 26 Copper. This group operated like a true crime employment agency, with the aim of eliminating rivals. However, their activities were temporarily disrupted due to their dismantlement. Despite this setback, assassinations continued to occur, leading to a large-scale trial known as Marengo, entirely focused on Tahi's organization. The latest mission attributed to this organization would have been the failed liquidation attempt on Emo in January 2017. In the upcoming Marengo trial, a soldier of Tahi named Nabil will play a crucial role as a crown witness against his own organization. Alongside this, it appears that Ridwa has made a shift in direction after the accidental execution of Hakim. He reportedly established rapid contact with another group specialized in liquidations. This led to the second major case in the Netherlands, known as Eris, involving members of the motorcycle club Kalo Wago. Among them, Delano, also known as Kilo, is said to have accepted 16 murder contracts in just six months. According to the public prosecutor, Ridwan is considered to be the most important client in this case. It's also intriguing that, as in the Marengo trial, there is another key witness preparing to testify against Kilo's organization in the Eris case, as we will discover it later. To better understand this connection between the two groups, let's revisit the mistake made during Hakim's death. Given Hakim's family's considerable influence in Utrecht's underworld, one of the three individuals involved in the initial phase of the mission, Farrell, quickly realized that retaliation was inevitable. Fearing for his own life, he contacted his father, Roel, who then asked his friend Kilo for help in protecting his son. Of course, this attendance was not disinterested. Once the help had been provided, Kilo would be entrusted with the work previously carried out by Farrell within the organization led by Tahi. In other words, Kilo intended to take over the responsibilities for the upcoming liquidations. All of this aligns with the pivotal testimony of the second key witness before the judge. Kilo informed me that Roa's son was involved in a mistaken murder, which caused issues. Roa had asked Kilo if he was interested in carrying out liquidations. There was a problem concerning his son, and he asked for Kilo's help. Due to the fear of retaliation, Farrell was well aware that someone would have to pay the price. This is how the new mission assigned to Kilo involves eliminating the driver Justin, which was meant to spare Farrell and his colleague. On 20th of January 2017, Justin sensed something was wrong with his teammates. He then confides in his father about what had previously happened, namely his involvement in the killing of Hakim a story he reportedly shared with several individuals. Once the situation between Roel and Kilo had been clarified, the planning begins. It seems that Roel is already putting pressure on Kilo to organize a three-way meeting with Farrell on 27th of January in Rotterdam. Brother, I have a meeting now and then, another one at 8.15 p.m., so I'll probably finish around 10 p.m., my son is also with me and he wants to see you too. Is it possible for you to come in this direction? On which side, my friend? Rotterdam. Where I was recently? Yes, but only after 9 p.m. And in the evening, the meeting becomes a reality. I'm here. 
All right, I'm coming. The next day, Farrell and his teammate Guino set out to find Justin. Brother, this man is nowhere to be found. Who? Your son? No, this guy Justin. Neither his girlfriend nor his mother knows where he is. I was ready. Let's cancel it for now. The discussions between Kilo and Roel reveal that Justin couldn't be found as desired. Ferrell and Guino visited his mother's residence, his girlfriend's place, and finally his father's apartment in Rotterdam, where they eventually located Justin. Later, the father testified that Justin went for a walk with the two teammates, and upon his return late in the evening, Justin informed him that he had to do something new for the group. He also mentioned that if something happened to him, Guino and Farrell would be responsible. The father even remembers giving Justin a Leica SIM card so he could keep in touch with his team, who insisted on his availability. He found this man. He's here in Rotterdam at his father's place. Now Farrell is in the car with me around, but set up an appointment for Monday if not the day after. Sounds good. Make sure he organizes things well. I just received a message that the guy might be dropped off tomorrow, so you need to be ready. He's asking if you have a moment now to come see him at Amsterdam. He will send you a message himself. Brother, how are you doing? Can you meet me later at Amsterdam or early tomorrow morning? So what do we agree on then? Brother, come before noon if you read this. Kilo seems to prefer avoiding direct communication with Farrell via messages and would rather go through his father, Roel. In reality, I don't contact anyone. I do it for you. What time do you want to see Farrell? As soon as possible. And where are you right now? At the sports park. There's a cab there. And a little while later, Kilo adds. Explain to that guy that I need two cars. He knows well. Okay. Farrell and Kilo have planned to meet around noon near a sports complex that includes a football field to discuss the mission. Kilo needs the organization associated with Tahi to provide him with the vehicles that will be used for the getaway. Indeed, Kilo's group only needs to ensure the execution of the eliminations without worrying about the logistics. Does Kilo also work for others or only for Tahi? Most of his work is for Tahi. He prefers working for him because he pays the most and provides everything. Cars, weapons, everything. And 9 out of 10 times, his group also sets up the decoy. His team arranges everything. Kilo just needs to drive and shoot. So, he handles the cars and the decoys? Yes, actually. He manages the whole setup. Only Kilo needs to ensure that it's executed. On the same day, Justin's Leica number is called for a scheduled meeting during the day, involving Farrell and Guino, among others. It seems they're under a lot of pressure to get the mission up and running, as it's already been over two weeks since the mistake was made with Hakim. Brother, this matter must be resolved today. These men are putting pressure. Tomorrow, it will have consequences for these men. Today's not possible. I have to sort out my things. I explained that to this man. I need a day. Okay. Otherwise, we'll make mistakes. After a thorough analysis, Farrell managed to find a solution to postpone the liquidation, while the transfer of the cars to Kilo's team for the ongoing mission was successfully carried out. Farrell is asking if you can meet him early in the morning. He has found a way to postpone this thing until tomorrow. Tomorrow, I will meet him. All right, then we'll talk in the morning. 
It is important to point out that there is an extension of the Tahi group which is intended to play the role of facilitator, in particular with the Kilo group. The highest ranking member is Jermaine, known in the encrypted messages as Wizard. According to the authorities, he plays a pivotal role in orchestrating the assassination activities, acting as an intermediary between presumably Tahi and Kilo. Wizard, who resides frequently in Spain, is seen as someone who blindly passes on ruthless liquidation orders. On January the 30th, Ferrell meets this mysterious wizard at coffee shop La Grotte in Amsterdam. The purpose of this meeting is to hand over a PGP phone to Ferrell, which is intended for Kilo. The message exchanges between Roel and Kilo reveal that the latter is somewhat hesitant about using this new received PGP phone. Can you respond to his message, please? He said he gave you a new phone, but you're not replying to his messages. He says these guys can see that you read the messages, but you don't reply. They're asking him why you're not responding. I know that. Because there's a tracker in the phone, so they know where everything is. And I don't want that. Your boy has to learn a lot of things. That's why these guys are controlling him. Keeler, who has more experience, is convinced that there is a transmitter built into the phone he received. He makes Roel understand that his son Farrell still has a lot to learn, as it seems that Wizard subjected him to the same surveillance. In any case, the mission must be completed that day. According to reports, Justin left his home around 5 p.m. to meet his alleged teammates. According to his father's statement, Justin had let him know that something would happen that evening and that he had one last task to complete. The gesture of his hand across his throat led his father to conclude that it involved killing someone. Justin doesn't realize that he's actually the main target of the day's program. After having several meetings with his two teammates and a mysterious stranger, first at La Garotte and then at a cafe called Tukalange in Amsterdam, finally they find themselves outside around 11 p.m. walking on the street, about 350 meters from Tukalange. Suddenly a man appears from nowhere and suddenly approaches Justin, who is at the head of the small group. Panicked, his companions flee, leaving Justin to face his inevitable fate alone. In an instant, he collapses. The presumed shooter was none other than Morian, a member of the Calo Wago Motorcycle Club, whose DNA was found on several shells found in the immediate vicinity of the victim. Kilo, on the other hand, recruited three individuals to carry out this mission. The usual duo, Morian and Orhan, were joined by another member of the club, Ferman, who took on the role of the driver. The day after the elimination, a beachside party was organized in Scheveningen as two individuals celebrated their birthday in the company of the bikers. One of the celebrants is none other than Ferman himself, who sent invitations to his family and friends, as indicated by the WhatsApp message received by Kilo. Dear friends, hereby I warmly invite you to celebrate my 30th birthday, Wednesday, February 1st, 2017, starting from 8 p.m. In a photo taken during this party, men are toasting and displaying wide smiles in a joyful and colorful atmosphere. It is particularly noteworthy that Furman later provided an alibi for his involvement in the elimination of Justin, claiming to have celebrated his birthday at his home in the company of, among others, his parents. This statement was backed by his family. However, the court found this version to be highly implausible. Secretly recorded conversations later revealed that, during his parents' visit to him in prison, on March the 4th, 2020, Furman had stated at that time that he had seen his parents together 
for the first time in his life, which casts doubt on his alibi. Indeed, they had separated when he was only six months old. But let's return to the party that was taking place near the beach. It's in this restaurant that the payment for the completed mission takes place. Germain personally handed over 26,500 euros to Ferrell so that the latter could pass them on to Kilo. During the exchange, Ferrell, accompanied by his father, handed a bag to Kilo. It was at this moment that he asked Kilo if he could take some of the money immediately, which seemed strange to Kilo. Despite his doubts, Kilo eventually gave in and allowed Ferrell to go to the restroom to take out 3,000 euros from the bag. However, Kilo later realized that he had been scammed, as Ferrell had ultimately taken 4,500 euros more than agreed. Moreover, a portion of the 26,500 euros was meant to be used by Kilo to pay the shooter, which aligns with images found on Morien's phone, in which he is seen holding a stack of bills in a restroom during the party. What's clear is that Ferrell took more money than agreed upon with Kilo. Finally, Wizard directly contacts Kilo. There are a few minor misunderstandings, so you'll need to discuss them with me in the coming days. Okay, sir? Yeah, I got it. Ready for action. It will be fine, sir. No stress. Definitely not, but it's troublesome for our people. Yes, of course, sir. We don't want to miss anyone on our side. You have to understand that. Did he explain the agreements between him and me to you? That I am mainly in contact with Farrell, but he assures me that you are also well informed. Yes, I just understood that, but don't worry, I get it. That same day, Farrell contacted Kilo and told him about the organization around Tahi and the process that needed to be followed. The most important thing is not to let these guys pressure you. Okay, and how do I know what the real prices are? He's honest with you. The whole organization is honest with you. The prices are always real. Oh, I see. Don't say anything about the money that was missing recently. No. Tell him that you've already sorted it out with me. I will sort it out with the big man. I arranged for it to be compensated. It will be fine. According to Farrell, Kilo shouldn't worry about the contracts carried out by Tahi's group, as the prices are always transparent and there is no deception. The key witness mentions that this conversation indicates the transition of responsibilities from Ferrell to Kilo. It seems to me that this discussion concerns the takeover, the work, so to speak, of Royal's son, Ferrell. What do you associate this with? I know he was having problems, and that's why Kilo stepped in to take it from him. And as for the big man behind it? Yes, it must be the boss. I believe the big man behind all of this is Tahi, because I've always understood that all the work actually comes from him, that he's the mastermind behind the liquidations. On the other hand, as Ferrell prepares to be questioned by the police about Justin's case because of his presence at the scene at the critical moment, Kilo gives him advice on how to approach the situation realistically and sensibly. But be a bit logical. Say them that you acted out of panic, right? Explain it that way. And you wanted to settle a dispute. You went with them, but you were afraid a few Africans got ripped off. Farrell followed the scenario described by Kilo during his interrogation. I know that Justin had stolen something from someone. Well, he had lost something. He went to talk to the person from whom he took these things, but they didn't believe him. He ended up with a huge debt because they didn't believe him. Justin asked me to accompany him to the meeting. I was supposed to watch the area. Justin knew some tough guys from the streets. They were Moroccans. He had a big debt to these Moroccans. I suspect it's about cocaine. 
To ensure that all traces of the Kilo team on mission are erased, it is imperative that one of the getaway cars, a Renault Clio, is meticulously cleaned as soon as possible. Then, on the night of 4th of February 2017, it was intentionally set on fire, with one of the protagonists, Orhan, suffering burns to the face. Kilo will make a detailed report of events to Wizard. One of my guys almost got burned as well. I will explain to you how to do it from now on in the best possible way without your guys getting hurt, and it burns down to the bone. You pour one bottle of flammable liquid inside and empty the other two on the windshield wipers. Then draw a line down to the side wing in the tire to the ground and set fire to it, keeping the windows closed. The windows explode, everything's on fire, and that's where the fuel goes into the engine and tank, so it explodes. It burns really well, and you have a few precious seconds to get away from it. I know quite a bit about Orhan. I remember one time he had to set a car on fire for a hit. It went wrong. Half of his face was badly burned. Indeed, it's important to highlight that at that moment, Kilo and Wizard do not know each other and are not truly aware of each other's identity during the message exchanges. I'm going to be honest with you. At first, I thought you were all like our little buddies, but you operate in a solid manner. We really need to get to know each other better, brother. Thank you for the respect, my brother. But you know in these matters, you need to have respect. And that's what I explained to these young ones. It's not about fame and all that. It goes beyond that. And that respect is mutual. Don't forget, brother. Yes, I feel that, brother. These young ones really don't understand, do they? Kilo implies to Wizard that he made an exception by helping Feral. With that money, I would have never helped that kid. I made a decision within a day. I felt his panic, and I know his father. At first, I hesitated because he didn't even say a word to his father. He was also really scared of you. It seems that Feral, out of fear of retaliation, did not reveal the whole truth to his own father. Indeed, Wizard has known Feral's family since their childhood. Yet, Feral did not even mention Wizard's involvement in the operation to his father. The exchanged messages indicate that Roel is unaware that Wizard is alive, suggesting that his son didn't tell him anything about the group. Furthermore, Kilo implies that Justin talked in the underworld, possibly more than we think. He adds that if he were in Wizard's team's position, he wouldn't have spared the duo, and they should really be grateful to him. Wizard agrees with these remarks, but due to his closeness to the two, he feels he was able to save them while benefiting from Justin's liquidation. Ultimately, the two high-ranking individuals are getting to know each other more and more. Brother, I appreciate your trust and respect. I will just tell you who I am, and I will keep to myself who you are. I am Kilo, leader of the Crips and the Major Motorcycle Club. If people find out about our collaboration, entire law enforcement teams will come down on us. Okay, okay, brother. I've also heard about that name. But I think you should know it now, especially because you're honest with me too. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, my brother. I protect your name, you protect mine. For the rest, we can play. I have enough soldiers. If I hear your name anywhere, I'll take care of it, and I assume you do the same. The funniest thing is that this kid came with his father, who is also in my club, to give me some work. <laughs> I felt he didn't know what he was doing. I asked him to put all of his cards on the table. He didn't want to say anything, not even to tell his father. I said okay, but give up this business if I help you. He was so panicked and said yes. By giving up the business, it would mean that future liquidations would be taken over by Kilo, without needing Farrell while still paying him a commission. They introduced themselves to Kilo, so they provided him with work, and for each act that would be carried out, they'd receive money, 
They facilitated the executions by Kilo within a group he hadn't been in touch with before, and this contact was made through them, earning them a certain amount of money for each committed liquidation. As mentioned earlier, it seems that Kilo was duped by Farrell when he took more commission than expected. Brother, on the day that money arrived, how much did you receive? Brother, what you're asking me now, I didn't even want to talk about it. Farrell also asked me not to talk about it, with you or the others. I was at the party. It was lively. He came with that bag. I didn't count. Then he asked if he could have a share, him and his father. Actually, I didn't want to, because it was for the shooter. But then I said, okay, what do you want? He said he'll pass them to you. At that moment, I found it weird. Then I said, okay, go to the toilet and take the 3K. Then they left. It was only at home that I realized 4,500 euro was missing in addition to the 3,000 euro. After hearing the story, Wizard made it clear to his new colleague that something would have to be done about the situation. What should I do? Tell me, brother. I don't want to harm him. I will just keep an eye on his affairs. I will watch over him. Because he has been a bit paranoid lately, and he's deep into drugs now. I hope he's still strong. If not, I'll have to remove him. Make them understand. They will go to hell if they mess things up. So they decide to keep him out of the big business and give him and his father only odd jobs. So there's little chance of them cooking something up. But it won't be for long, as there's plenty of evidence left behind from the first mission to eliminate Emo. As a result, Guino and Farrell are arrested and charged on March 28, 2017. It would appear, from discreetly recorded taps, that they are trying to harmonize their versions. However, Justin's father poses a problem as he did not hesitate to speak to the police the day after his son was killed. Is it the damn father of Justin who's talking, isn't it? Regarding this whole affair involving Emo, Farrell and Guino have been seen by the justice system as ruthless young men. We're talking about two men here who are willing to first kill someone, then direct others within the next 48 hours to ensure the right target is eventually eliminated. On the other hand, the mission carried out against Justin has set in motion the machine initiated by Keeler with a new list of targets to eliminate. You learned from Kilo, didn't you, that Taki was happy he took over? Yes, because Kilo had many soldiers. I know they were very happy with Kilo, as many of Tahi's guys were already in prison for murders. And yes, that's when Kilo took over. However, before the situation gets out of hand, it is important to understand that the failure resulting from Hakim's murder also acts as a catalyst in the milieu, forcing Nabil to make a difficult choice. <laughs> 